Welcome back to the LEC, guys. Fnatic just won their first win of the week, and I have Ilisang with me to talk about the game. But I don't think there's actually so much to say about the game. Looking at it, it I mean, you were ahead when it comes to objectives and kills, but I feel like it took you guys a long time to end the game. Do you agree on that? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We maybe we could end earlier, but didn't really feel like diving them on tier three turrets. Kind of like take it slower than. Um, just make sure we win the game instead of like trying to make highlights and yeah we just took it safe and yeah make sure that we don't lose the game rather than win it fast yeah no underestimating some teams and that's a good thing to do taking things slow i want to talk about the game itself now we saw that you me made a comeback today but i'm wondering is there more room for a poke and utility supports like you me in this meta i think there is if you have like Paired with a good jungle and AD carry, I think you can definitely pull out a Yumi. I think it's really hard to survive early game, but if you do, it's definitely worth it. Mm. And we'll see if you can play something else maybe tomorrow in match of the week. I saw that the production put an emphasis on bot lane matchup, especially the fact that Karzy may be baby reckless right now. Do you see something like this in him? I mean, he's definitely hungry for like fame and like to to show he is good, mm -hmm. but um, he has a long path to, to ride, so um, I think he's pretty good, but he has a lot of mistakes as well, so um, I hope we can exploit him tomorrow. I wish you good luck on this one. Thank you, Hilly, for the interview. Back to you guys. Awesome stuff. That was Hilly there with Law, and it is, of course, going to be a big challenge coming up next. We're going to move on to our next game, which is the surprise team from 2019. It's Rogue as they face off against Schalke No Fear. Um, now, we're asking you guys this year <laughs> that whether or not the Rogue hype train has slowed down, which does bring the question, are they the real deal? Yes or no? You can join the conversation by spamming your answer in the chat, while Frosk, you share your opinion. I feel like I did that a little bit too gently. I was like, oh yeah, they'll be typing. I was like, no, Twitch chat will be typing. No, they type like this. <laughs> yeah, so at first like one of those little birds. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, no, so I think it, the first thing to really pay attention to is where the goalposts are. If we say Rogue are the real deal, it's like, are Rogue the real that? deal to lift the trophy? Are they real deal for top four? And that's where my goalposts are. Yes, I think Rogue are a top four team, despite where they sit in the standings with Misfits and Mad Lions, kind of inching out over mm -hmm. them and like Rogue and Origin XL kind of falling to the wayside a little bit. And it starts with kind of three core factors. And the first one I want to start with is the draft phase. So uh, we talk about this all the time. We actually brought it up earlier with like SK and their not wanting to grab something like Soraka. Sure. Rogue do not have that problem. Every single big power pick, things like uh, the sets, I have no doubt that they can grab hold of the Ezreal and the Yumi. They've shown that they have the versatility mm. to grab whatever they want. All of those big, powerful meta picks and then also execute on them. In fact, the only thing that I've seen that they haven't really been able to gravitate towards are things like the uh, the AP junglers. Like, we haven't seen the Elise come out of Inspired. And I don't necessarily think that's because he cannot play it, just that he hasn't really need to show. He usually sits much more around those uh, those AD junglers. Sure. But there's, there's, that, there's no disputing that they are comfortable within a, a diverse set of different Ket champions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you even just look at not just the champions they pick, but also their inherent play styles. Larson was known as a control mage player, but he pulled out the Kiana, he got the Max Massive outplay on Febivin, so he can play both the control mage and the assassin playstyle. So it feels like Rogue are never going to be in a position where they hamstring string themselves in draft, which kind of moves on to the other point, and it's in-game decision making. So we know that Rogue are uh, able to play anything; they have more versatile styles, but can they actually make it count in game? And I really want to pull up the B-roll from the Mad Lions because in this matchup in particular, Mad actually started a uh, invade against a Jarvan versus Gragas matchup, knowing that. Jarvan usually wins it. So by invading, they put Inspired on a back foot and they tried to protect Shadow. Now, Inspired does a full top side clear very quickly here, resets, and then he immediately runs into Gragas' jungle to contest him. He spots that Gragas has done the scuttle crab. He hasn't started blue. And Inspired's like, you think you slowed me down, but I have now gotten right back on the footing and I'm ready to punch you in the face with the priority from his bot lane. So it's quick, creative thinking like this that allows Rogue that even if you kind of throw a wrench into their plans, they know how to reassess the game and re get back on their win conditions. Mm. Interesting. I mean, that's from obviously from one, I would imagine, experienced voice, perhaps Vander's playing a part in that. 
Yeah, Vander and uh, Inspired. I've listened to a couple of the the comms from uh, Rogue. Those guys talk a lot. We've heard uh, Inspired talk a lot in interviews as well. So I think Inspired was probably the biggest surprise from a lot of Rogue fans, just yeah. how uh, eloquent he is about the game. I think that this guy is really a superstar in the making. Dumb question before we move on. <laughs> is there a particular reason why they're going for such a you know ambitious invade versus the uh, versus their opposition there? Uh, I think it's because again Gragas. it was the the jungle matchup Jarvan versus Gragas, but it was still making sure that they were put on the back foot. Okay, what are the correct plans to? get back onto the right foot. Yeah. And it was like no wasted time. He immediately does full clear. He doesn't like dance around the red sure. buff and gets them back in track. So leads me to the final thing. We just Perfect. talked about Inspired. It's now also talking about the rest of the roster. It's not just Inspired that pops off for Rogue. It's the fact that they made uh, adjustments in their ADC position. Because last year, that was kind of the one position along from Rogue that really had an issue. But now bringing in Han Sama, you have players across the board that have the potential and the proven skill ceiling that they can punch with some of the best in the league. Right. And is that, would you consider that like baseline? You know, if you are going to be, as you've described them, the real deal, the baseline is you can mechanically compete. Yeah, you have to be frankly good enough right. and Hansama was just kind of the cherry on top and now it's really a question of where is the ceiling for guys like Finn where is the ceiling for guys like Larson and Spire there's this hype around them and you know that Hansama uh, if all he needs to do is play the ADC can have those high highs so I think that's kind of the the final question to really show our rogue fourth or are they third Right, so they can be flexible, they can adapt, and they've got the good enough players, they've got enough beef behind this brigade that they can fight with the best. They've also got a sick new hair color on Hansama there. Went from the silver to the blonde, and now back to dark Hansama, evil Ooh. Hansama after the Draven game. I live for it. Okay, so evil Hansama's in there, and uh, I don't know what upset uh, is necessarily classified as. Fiery, perhaps a fiery individual, but yes, we have got a lot going on in this real deal conversation. Frosca's presented her argument, and it seems like you guys have, uh, have tended to agree. A 62 to 38 lean, Rogue being the real deal. And against Schalke's new roster, we're expecting Rogue to come back with a vengeance. So let's see if they can get the win. We will see, Machine. Thank you very much, Frosk and Machine, for breaking down Rogue. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the other side of the matchup today. It's Schalke. They have been struggling so far this split, but they've made some changes coming into this week. Yeah, they've got Inax coming in from the bot lane. For those that may be unfamiliar, Inax has actually spent pretty much the last year playing with the Unicorns of Love yep. over in the LCL. Most recently, he has also been playing in the German Prime League, uh, and he's actually been incredibly yeah. successful. That team was undefeated until last night, I think it was. Yeah. Um, but the fact that they were undefeated, they seem to have a very strong uh, ERL team. And uh, they did bring up Lorox from that. And of course, he wasn't able to find a win last week. But perhaps with the introduction of Inax and Lorox together, uh, from I've heard from many people that watch a lot of the ERL leagues that these are two of the prime players that have a good chance of competing at the LEC level. We'll get to see today how they stack. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter saying that these are two of the guys that they expect to be able to join LEC teams next year. Of course, they're being promoted just that little bit earlier than expected, but we'll see just how Schalke adapt and change for their new bot laner. Of course, teamed up alongside Dreams in that bottom lane. Now, I did watch some of Inax across worlds. Uh, of course, he was in the Plains Unicorns of Love squad that challenged Splice, took yeah. them to all five games, and he tends to be a traditional marksman player. Had a couple of Heimerdinger games in there. Yeah, Heimerdinger was the champion yeah. I remember him from. But yeah. against Hans Summer, I'm expecting very traditional bot laners to be played in this match. Well, I wonder, because, you know, they've got nothing to lose. They it's haven't true. won a game yet, this split. And I do think that what Odo Amne has been very solid up in the top lane, I think that maybe you go for something a little bit different down the bot side of the map. Maybe you do consider something like a Heimerdinger. We'll have to see which direction the draft somewhat takes. Uh, I think that Rogue have been pre conventional, been pretty meta so far yep. with a lot of their drafts. I say that they often go to more towards the scaling angle. I wonder if we are going to see the continued focus on things like Azia, maybe a Corky as well in the mid lane for Larson. We did see a bit of Lissandra from him last week, um, but we know that Abadage is someone that does like to try and play that LeBlanc, uh, and I, I know that the uh, Lissandra can be a good way to shut that down. And Larson was traditionally known for his Azir and Corky when he first came onto yes. the LEC stage. With them being buffed on 10.3, wouldn't be surprised at all if we see Larson falling back to some of those more scaling, in inverted commas as well, safer picks early on. Now, we're gonna jump on into Champion Select. So far today, we have seen Soraka, we have seen Karthus, and we have seen Ezreal in a lot of our games and in a lot of our bands. We'll see if that continues to be the case here. Because I'm not gonna try and speak over the music. I say while speaking over the music. Now, Jake has never did this last time. I'm not sure how well it works. We'll listen back 
and see. But for now, we're going to jump straight on in. And the bands are rattling off thick and fast already. Shao could get rid of the Olaf and the LeBlanc themselves, and Rogue will remove Syndra. Okay, the Yumi being banned as well. So we can see throughout the day that Yumi, very high priority for yeah. many of the teams, picked or banned 100% so far throughout the day. Uh, we're also going to see the Soraka taken off the board from Schalke. Clearly don't want to put a huge amount of priority on that. Obviously, a lot of AD carries left up and available. The Aphelios is something that you have to take into consideration. Do Schalke want to try and grab that pick up early? Or instead, will they go for a top lane champ? And it looks like that Set will be the priority this time around. So Set, of course, is still flexible. Can go jungle. We've seen him mid from G2 last week, but I'd love to see Odo on a champion that can really dominate his lane and have power in that laning phase like the set. We'll see where Rogue decide to go next. You said they've been relatively conventional with their drafts and what more conventional can you get than a Gragas in the jungle? And uh, with the Aphelio still up and available, we know that Han Summer does love to play. It's a champion he's very comfortable on. Yep. Rogue are going to be very happy with this half of the draft right now. Very safe, very reliable. And Schalke immediately going to respond with the Zyre Rakan in the bot side of the map. So we will see Inax and Dreams going for the Lovers duo. Considered a pretty, well, strong duo when paired together yep. in isolation. Perhaps not considered the strongest in the current meta. But as we heard from Kadrill in his interview earlier in the day, he talked about how the bot lane meta has kind of shifted quite a lot with the recent nerfs, especially to Senna. A lot of champions could be a lot of other champions now. And with the low mobility that exists on top of Aphelios, you can understand why champions like Rakan offer good setup. So overall, solid engage coming up from the side of Schalke. You're going to have a strong top side matchup as well, given that you now know it's going into the Aatrox, which means that Schalke should actually be able to get push in top and bot. And I think they should look to start banning away these supports, consider taking away things like the Nautilus, maybe take away the Morgana as well, and just limit some of these good matchups that can mitigate a lot of Rakan likes to do in the laning phase. Yeah, there's a few matchups that you want to get rid of. As you said, Nautilus and Morgana, but I'd put the Leona on that list somewhere as After well. After the nerfs, I wonder if they still value her as a high priority ban. That's true. I'm just thinking about how much you can disrupt Rakan when it comes to fighting. If you stun him as he tries to get in, if you stun him as he tries to get out, it can be very difficult to play around. Now, Rogue will get rid of the Cassiopeia themselves, and Schalke, you expect to see support bans. It's what you said. Thresh will be the first oh, one Thresh on the menu. Thresh is another good one. Yeah, yeah, I think that Thresh is a pretty good pick into the Rakan. Also very meta and works extremely well with the Aphelios, offering that lantern in the event that Aphelios is in danger. So I like the ban a lot coming out from Schalke. Rogue, considering that they have priority on uh, the next pick. It looks like right now they're just trying to ban away some of the more obnoxious mid lane champions with LeBlanc and Cassio ban. I wonder if they'll want to try and tunnel deeper into this pool. It looks like for now they won't. They're actually going to limit some of the junglers, but Lee Sin still up and available. We Sejuani. know that Lorox is happy to play that. Sejuani, it would offer a bit of extra engage. Um, I debate whether or not they want to do it into a Gragas, but definitely yep. an option I think is worth considering. Um, right now I've heard that a lot of the Champions from before, so the Elise, the Rek'Sai, the Lee Sin, still kind of top dog okay. uh, outside of the Gragas, of course. Um, so that, that's where my expectations lie for the time being, but we'll see what direction Schalke choose to go. We definitely will. I think uh, Lorox had a couple of okay games last week, but will really still be looking to prove himself on the LEC stage. We talked about safety with the Thresh. Vanda picking the time. Kench does give Aphelios a little bit more safety in the bottom lane, but you are you are cringing and screwing up I, your face uh, at this, buddy. I don't like Tom Kench, man. I'm not a fan of it. I think that you just concede so much lane power. I understand the goal of what it's trying to do, but I'm never really a fan of it. I think you lose a lot in the laning phase, but in terms of the overall comp, sure, it makes sense. But there's the Sejuani that you were talking about, Medic. It does offer that additional engage uh, in the current meta. It's like risen in priority due to the jungle changes on top of the fact that Sejuani herself got buffs. Now what Schalke doing are missing a mid laner. Uh, today we've seen a lot of blind pick Zoe as a very safe option, and it looks like that Schalke are going to continue with that trend. So when we look at that comp overall, pretty solid scaling. Um, they have pretty reliable engage, but ooh, we're all gonna answer with a Tristana in the mid lane. I really love this uh, mid jungle duo that they have for themselves. Very easy to play around, uh, pretty easy to bully the Zoe as well. And you can easily find these advantages in Rogue, considering that Gragas brings a lot of AP damage to the forefront. Um, they're gonna rely on him to offer that, but also they're relying on Inspired to be one of the primary engage tools. And I don't know how much faith I have in Inspired to be that. He hasn't really been that for a lot of the split so far. When we look at the engages, uh, often it's been someone like the Finn or Vanda finding successful flanks or being one of those people that just actually kicks off the fight. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. I quite like Schalke with 
the amount of disengage they have with things like the Sejuani Ultimate, the Sleepy Trouble Bubble. Shalka have really strong pick tools. Okay. They have really strong engage tools. I think they have pretty good follow-up and they have good flanking opportunities. Um, it's quite an interesting comp. I think the scaling's pretty good, but against the double AD carry of Rogue, I think it will fall off relative in the late game. Uh, we'll see how Larson and Hans Summer can team up. I believe it's the first time we have ever seen Larson pick up to Tristana, of course is known as a mid lane answer to things. You know, you can you can jump on people, you have really powerful level two, level three in that lane, you can harass people out of lane. You can even see Abadage is running heel on this Zoe just to keep himself that little bit safer from Larson on Tristana. It's gonna be an exciting one. Inax, of course, I suppose returning to the LEC stage given that he was here for the World Championship. That is true. Uh, we'll see how he stacks up. Can he be the change that Schalke need in order to get themselves their first win on the board? Rogue trying to bounce back after what was a bit of a rough week three, currently sitting at three and three in the standings. Uh, we're going to be jumping in for Rogue versus Schalke. Definitely an interesting game to uh, set up for game four of the day. And in we go onto the Summoner's Rift once again. And as you say, Rogue did have a, a disappointing week by their standards. Uh, their first game against G2, they were about a thousand gold ahead at the 15 minute mark, ended up losing that one in some pretty epic late game team fights. And then against Mad Lions, they were actually three and a half K ahead and ended up losing that one as well. Just weren't able to cut down uh, the Mad Lions as the Soraka kept healing them up. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, that's a great point that you mentioned, actually, Medic, uh, about the Soraka. Uh, I believe we actually have some information relating to it because uh, two of the losses that Schalke did experience was to this champion. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, they went 0-2. You can see that the goal difference was uh, pretty significant. They got these huge early game leads, yep. but then they just couldn't close things out because Rogue have this... Uh, they have this tendency, Medic, that they've had so far, this flip, split where they take these mid to late game team fights, normally around the 25 to 28 minute mark, where things just kind of go wrong for them. They over aggress, they try to find these flank TPs, they just try to force a fight that just doesn't go in their favor. And I've decided to title it, they go rogue, right? <laughs> because it's just something where they, they force a play and then it just doesn't work out and then the game suddenly becomes a lot harder. And in week one, we saw last them carry them out of those situations. Yep. And we've even seen them with, go with scaling comps that have kind of remedied that factor. But last week in week three, champions like Soraka, when you had those bad fights, she then got to the late game and then Rogue could not win any more fights. So something I'll be tracking as we get to that 25 to uh, 28 minute mark is, will Rogue go Rogue and put themselves in a similar situation? Will they put their hoods up, blinkers on, and just dive into the fight, even if it's against their better judgment? But we have a long time before yes. that's going to happen, Vedius. And I want to focus in on a couple of lane matchups. You can see right now that the Zyra Khan has push. This is one of the reasons why I'm not a massive fan of Tom Kench um, in the draft. Again, I understand how it makes sense paired up with the Felios. In the late game, offers a great amount of peel. You can attack the side lanes with the champion as well. And it can be pretty good against someone like a Zoe that maybe goes up to those side lanes to help wave clear. Um, but during the laning phase, you can see a lot of pressure. Now, when we look at the mid lane, what's really interesting about this matchup is you see that it is used as a counter pick to Zoe. And the thing about Zoe is she's typically very good at getting priority in the laning phase. And when trying to get priority, the thing you have to consider is how quickly do you kill the melee minions? And this is why Zoe's great. Her Q is low mana, high damage, and low cooldown, which means she can just throw that out very efficiently in the early game to help get that early game push. But Tristana just relies on the auto attack and the splash damage to just mow these melee minions down. And as you can see, he just slowly gets pushed back further and further, and Larson is able to gain a lot of priority and a lot of pressure in this lane. Also meant that Larson was able to get a ward on the razor beaks of Schalke, knowing Lorox's path early on. Lorox has gone for a full jungle clear. He's going towards his Krugs. We'll get that little bit of experience from those now. Of course, with the 10.3 changes. But it does mean he sacrifices this bottom side Scuttle. And I wonder if Inspired will now path up towards top side to make sure he gets double Scuttle early on. Yeah, well, I think he can because you'll notice on the minimap once again, there is push up towards the top side and Zoe against Trisana. Yes, while Trisana will have push for a lot of the laning phase, it doesn't mean she's completely pushed out. As I say that, she's getting all in by the Tristana. And this is kind of the next thing about the match. We don't have time, train the bot lane. We do have time, Bedios. The trade happened. Hansama and Vanda were able to push Dreams and Inax back, but underneath the turret, they should be safe. Okay, so uh, not a great trade there for Inax and uh, Dreams. Not entirely sure what happened, so they ended up in this situation because normally this shouldn't happen. I think they when... both got rooted by the Graviton. Uh... I believe that's what happened. 
But it's very surprising. It looks like Dreams actually took a pretty poor trade early on where he tried to force an all-in, and that's when Time Kench can okay. actually punish you because you can then chase them down. Um, and because he took a bad trade, they were forced to play more defensively, which then put Inax on the back foot, and then they set up for that uh, play underneath the tower. And even though Inax and Dreams did have that push early on, they are 14 CS down. They're losing a cannon wave because they've got heal instead of teleport, so they can't get back to this wave quickly. On Summer and Vanda having a very good time early. Let's have a look at this. So we can actually see the uh, Severum paired up with the Gravitum allows... So the Severum, the red one, when you use the Q, it applies both your on-hand and off-hand effects to the target, which means that you can then swap to your Gravitum, pop it, and you can apply the root pretty effectively, which allows them to get a pretty favorable trade. And it's, it all just comes from them taking one bad trade early on in the laning phase, um, which then ends up getting very effectively punished by the likes of Han Sama. And just goes to show how strong of an AD carry player he actually is. Uh, and Hans Hammer already dominating in a lane that really Rogue should be falling behind in during the early laning phase. So props to the Rogue duo. Yeah, definitely in a very good position at the moment. Getting that plate will mean he's about 300 gold ahead in the lane. Has got a BF sword to the cull of Inax. Now, as soon as you get cull when you know your enemy's getting a BF sword, you're pretty much giving up that laning phase. So Shalka perhaps will look up towards the top side because that's where their pushing lane will now become. And you can see Inspired thinking about it. He's up here, he's looking to see if he can get anything done, but decides against it. And we'll just back away and go back to farming his jungle. And you can see the lifesteal now being picked up for Larson. And I, I talk a lot about this mid lane matchup because, I mean, mid lane is super interesting to me. Uh, but is it because you're a mid lane matchup? <laughs> I yes? mean, yeah, partially. But I think it makes a lot of sense against Zoe because a lot of her power in lane comes from her poke. Uh, and by going for early lifesteal, it helps mitigate a lot of that poke and helps you deal with it. But also, I think this is useful information for people that see Zoe in their solo queue game. One of the easiest ways to, like, deal with her is to have stronger wave clear and ways in which you can mitigate her poke. And that's why Tristana is such a strong champion because it also scales better in terms of your 1v1 in the side lane. And I think that you can hit a pretty powerful mid-game spike as well by usually going for an early Blade of the Ruin King, which is a very powerful trading tool. And when paired with the bombs on the Tristana as well, means that you have a very strong 2v2 when paired up with your jungle. Inspired was down here. He scouted out Lorux and with the control ward, Rogue will be able to clear out any vision down towards this bottom side now. Inspired gets the ward across the wall. I was wondering if perhaps he'd look for an invade, but instead he's just going to get all of this vision removed and make sure Shalka are in total darkness as it is an infernal dragon on the rift early on. And it looks like Rokar's setting up to take it. They're using their mid priority right now in order to secure this objective. Inspired should be able to solo it. And if we have a quick pan down to the bot lane, you should be able to see that Han Summer and Vanda have control over this wave and they're zoning Dreams and Inax away. Even though there's actually no minion wave here, rogues still have control. So props to them. Lorox, so we're just going to fake check this one. This is dangerous, though, because again, the bot lane of Rogue can collapse first, and same for the mid lane. And you can already see them moving. That's why Lorox can't contest. The dragon was low enough for him to get that steal. And while this play was relatively safe, because Sejuani had the flash up, also had the Q available, it meant that there was no real risk. But it was a great representation of why, maybe in solo queue, if you try to contest those rakes, you can't always, yeah. because you don't have the appropriate uh, pressure on either lane. Oh, it's always joyful when your jungler starts up the Drake, you've just reset the wave, pushed <laughs> yes. into your tower, you're like, oh, why didn't you help me? It's like, well, I wasn't actually anywhere near you. Exactly. And didn't have Moby Boots early on, but that CS lead in the bottom lane is only going to keep extending as Hans Summer now has about 25 farm over Inax, who's sitting at 47, not stacking that call up as quickly as he'd like. And with it cutting up to the eight minute mark, Vedius, I predict a lane swap. Usually we see Hans Summer yes. and Vanda go up towards that Rift Herald and try and help their team secure it. Come on, Medic, let's see if your prediction is right. Vanda, level five right now, passing towards the Rift Herald. The Aphelios is also making his way across. Medic, oh. someone's been doing their homework. I mean, all I did was listen to Foscuren's incredible <laughs> setting up for Rift Herald segment. I think it was two weeks ago in the Vitality XL game. I mean, yes. Uh, as much as I acknowledge your recognition of the lane swap, it is something that we've been seeing a lot, especially in Europe around this point in the game. You try to get a good reset off and then you swap towards the top side. The fact that Rogue had already taken the Drake means that it, it's a very easy yeah. swap for them to make. The teleport is not available on Finn, but the same can be said for Oduwamne, and because Rogue is first on the play, they should be able to get control, because you'll notice that they'll actually look to push in that top wave first. This will force Shalka to catch that wave, and then while Shalka are in the river right now, they're going to lose all this vision, because Rogue can use their priority in mid lane and top lane to then move into the river. I guess the only benefit for Shalka is that they have secured the Rift Scuttler, so they have some vision over the area. They were able to get a couple of wards in, but the three-man squad of Rogue will clear out one of those control wards, and may look 
to force either Inex or Dreams to burn a summoner before they go for the actual Rift Herald itself. They're just going to prioritize on looking for that early push for now. Uh, they will have, as we can see, a lot of respect being shown. I think a lot of it comes down to this early itemization, but also the fact that Gragas is lingering nearby and Inex and Dreams want to show that respect. Uh, but now the BF Sword has been completed for Inex. Of course, doesn't have the same Zerka's Greaves that uh, Han Summer has for himself. So you can see that Rogue not entirely confident wanting to start this one off. Of course, Larson is currently on the blue buff, yeah. which is probably a large reason as to why that is. But both teleports are coming up from uh, the top laners. Fins will be up a little bit before. So let's see if Rogue want to try and uh, force a play before Shalkas will be available. So I really like this idea from Shalka. They've seeded River Control, and they're trying to bring Lorax in through the lane to see if they can catch out Han Summer or Vander. We'll see if they're able to do it. Inspired, lurking just around the corner. We'll no make his uh, position known to Dreams, and Dreams just backs away. Now they use the sweeper, clear out any vision. They did miss a ward in the bush at the top, but more about making sure that their jungle is secure. We have talked about the AD carries items quite a bit. Bilgewater Cutlass now finished on Larson, so he is going towards that Blade of the Moon King. And I was interested to see Odo Wamle go for a Barmy's uh, Br Bramble Vest to kick us yeah. off, especially since he's going Conqueror. He's not going for that full tank set. It's something that we see a lot of, though, uh, in this matchup, at least more recently, because it's a relatively cheap item, and the Grievous Wounds application to the, um, the Aatrox is just extremely valuable. Uh, it helps you trade a lot and Aatrox doesn't get to take advantage of his passive, which gives you that increase. That's a lot of where your life still comes yeah. from uh, during the laning phase when you're going for these early trades. And so by cutting that in half, it allows you to take advantage of your high health regeneration on the uh, on the set, and you can just get a lot of favorable trades. And that's a large part of why set can get this early lane pressure. But it looks like that we actually see a bit of uh, trading down towards the bot side. Flash actually burned. Flash from Finn, Flash from Odo Omni. There's the showstopper and Finn on the wrong side of this, but Inspired's on his way. They're looking for the stun. There's the first Haymaker coming out as well, but the second stun comes in. Finn doing it on Aatrox once again, just turns it straight on its head. Lorox should fall here as Inspired flashes underneath the turret. It's two to Rogue. Yeah, Rogue are able to turn that play in their favor. And a lot of it comes off the back of a great engage off the back of Inspired. I think that ultimate managed to knock Odoame just out of the way so that the true damage doesn't come through onto Finn. It was only the regular physical damage being applied from that Haymaker. So when we get a look at the replay, we'll get to see that one back out. But Inspired playing well around the bot side of the map, which is interesting because you would expect when that play to happen, Rogue would actually trade it for a top lane Rift Herald. But because he's in that position, not only do they get two kills, he can now path his way back up. Finn still has the teleport. And I like this. Notice he's walking back down towards bot lane. He wants to keep this available as we see some trading in the mid lane once again. Yeah, Larson jumps in, but Abalage did have the exhaust on his W, so it's pretty hard to go for anything more. Root's gonna land, there's a charm as well on Vanda. Ignite is ticking away, but the sentry there with the Gravitum means that Shalko won't want to force anything more. And don't actually see a summoner burnt from Vanda. He was able to stay safe for long enough. That's a little bit more of what I'm used to seeing from the Zyra Khan lanes, where you can get these favorable trades against a Time Kench if they overstep, because of the high mobility of Rakan, it's often actually difficult to answer back. It's fortunate for Han Summer that he had the, um, the, the Shuriken's turret, because yes. that was a great deterrent, as we see an all-in now from Larson. Cleanse used. Sleepy Trouble Bob was not going to connect. Larson, connect. Larson has to jump away. And uh, no summoners burnt in the mid lane once again. Ocean Dragon taken by Lorux. It felt like... Schalke sort of gave up control of this topside river, understanding they couldn't really win the 3v3, and so Lorox just decided to get something on the other side of the map. Rogue will get the Rift Herald, and at the moment have a 2,500 gold lead, 15 min 13 minutes in. Well, uh, oh, excuse me. A lot of that, of course, comes from the AD carry CS difference, but um, we're going to have a look at this replay right now. So Finn uses his Q. That Odo Anme uses that as an opportunity to dive in. He sidesteps pretty much all of the damage, and then he uses the ultimate just as Finn's W is being applied to him uh, to be able to drag Finn back. And there we see the W just knocking him slightly south of Finn so that true damage doesn't get applied. And then, of course, Finn gets all this lifesteal back off the Sejuani. Inspired, forced to use his flash on top of the W to help secure that final kill. And um, I'm not sure if there's much more that Shalka really could have done in that situation. Uh, it's just a matter of unlucky timing that Inspired arrived when he did, and he yeah. was able to land that uh, good ultimate. So props to Inspired there as they use the uh, Rift Tower mid lane. Inspired has a... Uh has his moments of brilliance. Like, his ability to track his enemy jungle is usually pretty on point. We saw it paying off for them in the bottom lane there. Now with mid lane turret broken open, 
It's uh, a lot easier for Rogue to get this uh, goon squad of Tristana and Gragas across the map. Do a lot of damage, a lot of burst, actually, on Tristana and Gragas. Lorax perhaps not knowing that Looks Rogue like... around the corner. Uh, but Argo will now know. Looks like they just silently pass each other. But we can see some of the big uh, atomization now completed for the mid laners specifically. Luden's Echo now done for the uh, Zoe will definitely help a lot in terms of her poke. But Blade of the Rune King also finished for Larson. And we talked about how uh, this first item spike for Tristana very strong, especially now that the Trist is level 11 as well. Um, the Tristana is going to be very difficult to duel and deal with, especially in a side lane. So if they wanted to, they can start moving Larson to be this like siege champion off on a side lane. He's not gone for a... Um, Demolish. Sometimes we would see that from yeah. Tristana players, where they would actually run Demolish, move to a side lane, and then they would just siege through all these towers, and no one could outduel them. So you just kind of had to sit there and let it happen. Uh, Larson going more for the sorcery option instead. And it's working out for him so far. Has about a 15 CS lead, about 34, 35 in the bottom lane. Uh, Han Summer over Inax, and it felt like Schalke hasn't really been able to use those pushing top and pushing bot that we discussed in pick and ban. Of course. Losing uh, out early against Han Summer and Vanda did cost Inax and Dreams. And now we see if Schalke can do something in this mid game. Maybe wait for Rogue to go Rogue in one of these fights and then capitalize on a Rogue mistake. Because this is something that we see Rogue do a lot, especially within the first 20 minutes of the game. It's just their lane assignments are often very good. They play around objectives extremely well. They have a very good head on their shoulders when it comes to reading the map state and knowing what they can and can't do. And again, like you can see it right now. Notice how, um, if we can... Yes, we can. <laughs> I'll remove the glass that covers our talisman. Uh, notice how every time uh, the mid lane is being pushed in, Larson is rotating down in towards the enemy jungle, and this then facilitates the jungler to move bot. So all of their movements are in support of each other. Everyone is doing something to help one another. Meanwhile, Hans Summer and Vanda playing extremely defensive on the top side of the map. They're not overexerting themselves. They're not trying to win any trades. They're just sitting under their tower, accepting the farm as it comes to them, and they're not pushing anything, which just means that you can see that Rogue are just respecting what they can and cannot do, and that has just converted them into another tier one tower in the bot lane, with Schalke not being able to do anything. And they're 4,000 gold ahead right now, a substantial lead this early on in the game. And I, you, you were talking about how Schalke aren't able to do anything. Like, they're not able to play against this because Rogue's positioning in lane and their lane assignments are so good. If you were Schalke, if you were coach for Schalke right now, what would you be telling them to do? I mean, so you just have to commit a little bit harder because while uh, Rogue are investing three people bot, you can invest three people top and you can force the tower. So while Rogue are taking that tier one, what Schalke wanted to be doing was trying to take the tier one on the top side. So every time they make a move, you can try and trade on the other side of the map. Now, of course, that's a little bit harder because you don't always get mid prio uh, against the Tristana who's shoving you underneath that tower all the time. But you also know that Larson was playing a lot towards the bot side of the map. So you have to consider like, oh, maybe I just sacrifice a bit of this experience and farm in order to play towards top side. It's never going to be easy because Schalke's in a losing position. So often when you're trading things, you're losing more yeah. than you're able to trade back. But at least it gets you some objectives on the map. At least it gets you a little bit more control because if you just look at the map state right now, you'll notice that Rogue is up four towers yep. to the zero of Schalke and Drake is spawning soon, but Rogue is already in a position where they're ready to set up for it. They have the wave up top that they're going to be pushing out from Finn. His teleport is available. So all Schalke needs to do now is stall or maybe they just don't contest it at all because they were a little bit slow to the play. It feels like it. Schalke in the right position at the right time. Rogue could have gone for it, but they decided against it. They didn't want to walk into the darkness of the river. Yeah, so watch now what Rogue do. They push in mid. They know they have the advantage in this situation because Schalke have to take the long way around. So what are they doing with this opportunity? Stealing away enemy topside jungle camps. Sleep's gonna land, Blade of the Rune King stolen away by Abadage, but the jump continues. Larson on the chase, one more auto is enough. And Larson gets a solo kill. Well, we get to see some of the all-in power of the Tristana there in the 1v1. He's gonna be able to push out bot. Hansam is gonna be able to push out mid. And you have two people pushing in top as well. Rogue generating a lot of pressure all around the map right now. And Schalke is struggling to answer, especially with the loss of Abadage in that 1v1. You can see Hansam and Vanda coming down here. Bit of protection for Larson, but that double AD carry AD Carry will shred through turrets in a heartbeat. Lorox the only one here to defend right now as the wave begins to push in. Severum gonna clear out that wave. We'll see if Dreams can get a flank off because this is something that Rakan does do very well. The enemy overextends, you can jump in, but of course Larson could buffer 
his jump away if the quickness came out, and Vander always has the Devour to save Han Summer. So let's have a look back at this 1v1. The important thing to note is the fact that Cleanse is available on Larson. He avoids the Q, which ends up getting used on the minion wave. Of course, uh, <laughs> the cleanse, if the cleanse wasn't there, I think Abadag actually had a chance of being able to win this. Um, but because the damage is immediately removed and Abadagi doesn't get to use two rotations of his Q, yep. that's a large part of why he ended up losing there. So initially, it seems like strong damage from the Zoe, but uh, then the Tristana comes out and says, yeah, well, I get a reset on my W because I popped the bomb and now I get to chase you down and now you're dead. It's also very telegraphed where Larson needs to jump. If you yes. see one end of the portal, it's like, well, I wonder where he's going to end up in half a second. Just jump straight onto it and that's what Larson did as soon as he saw Abadaga using his ultimate. Now, second Rift Herald did go to Rogue. Uh, we saw Inspired secure it just now. We'll see where they use that. We are about five minutes away from Rogue, perhaps going Rogue in one of these team fights. But I think even if they take a really bad team fight right now, because of their 6,000 gold lead, they're probably going to win out. Uh, yes. Uh, um... It's, I probably didn't pick the best game to introduce that, it could, it that trend. Been. I mean, we may still see it, because the thing that happens is they often pick bad fights, but um, like everything about their control right now is so good. Their Baron is really fast as well, because you have Tom Kench who can help tank this uh, the tower a lot. Even though you don't have like a dedicated tank, Tom Kench can just mitigate a lot of the damage. Looks like he is working towards the stone plate as well. And uh, with the Death Dance now completed on Finn, just everyone on Rogue is just, it's just so strong. And it's, it's one of those situations where Rogue really has to mess up in order for them to lose control over this game. And uh, given their track record, they might do it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a possibility. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Right now, they're just kind of dancing around the, uh, the Drake, not going to be spawning for another two minutes. Kind of in a bit of... There's not really a lot to play for right now. Um, for Rogue, their best bet is to try and steal away some of the jungle camps, try and maintain control around Baron. They could consider trying to start it, but they're probably waiting for Han Summer and Larson to actually finish completing their items before they try and force that objective. And when we think about like ways in which Shao can come back into the game, um, I think their best bet is to try and look for picks. We talked about it in Draft, how they actually have pretty good pick power um, with things like the Rakan ultimate and the Sejuani ultimate that can kind of stack on top of each other. Then you can try and burst someone down with a Zoe and a Zaya. Uh, but in order to do that, you kind of have to have some vision control, which right now they're being starved of. They have pretty good vision on the bot side of the jungle, but again, Rogue is showing a lot of respect to that and uh, largely avoiding it. The speed of rotation coming out from the Abyssal Voyage as well makes it quite hard for Shalka to find an advantageous engage. Rift is going to be used bot lane about two minutes after it was taken. The charge will take down the turret, and this will be five turrets to nil in favor of Rogue. Shalka really haven't chipped away at the Rogue Towers either. All of them above half HP. There's the Moonlight Vigil into the root. Hansama just using it for the damage. The second Rift Tower charge comes out, and that turret's almost dead. Blade Caller was not able to find its mark. I like what Hansama did there. Yes, he did use the ultimate, but his purpose was to zone Inax away from the wave because he's the primary wave clear tool. With Abadage dealing with mid lane, if they zone Inax away, it guarantees that the Rift Tower is going to be able to land another charge, which then opens up the map a little bit more on the bot side. Now, Rogue only need a little bit more damage in order to secure this objective. And notice how they've now transitioned all of their pressure towards the bot side of the map. All that vision that Shalka had has now been cleared out, and Rogue have set themselves up to secure the next Drake. I think they're putting a little bit too much focus on it, personally. I think they should invest a little bit more towards the top side and look to trade that Drake for something like a Baron. Yeah. But the only other consideration they're probably making is the fact that Oduwame has TP. So he could probably solo the Drake, while the rest of Shalka just act as... Um, interference around the Baron, and then he can TP in later to assist Shalka should Rogue try to start the Baron, which is probably why Rogue are putting more focus on securing the Drake for now. Yeah, Odo's still only sitting on one completed item, about 50 farm behind in this side lane. Of course, it's been... He's had to deal with the fact he doesn't have a mid lane turret, doesn't have a tier 2. It's very hard for him to push forward and get as much CC, uh, CS as he'd like. And uh, now with Rogue getting their second dragon of the game, the soul is a long way away, but Rogue Pretty soon you have to feel, now with the Runans complete and the Essence Reaver complete on Larson, it's going to be very, very quick Baron take if they decide to go for it. And again, you'll notice Rogue playing through all three lanes. Um, they have this tendency to really push the mid lane in very deep. Okay. They are a team that often plays through mid lane. Everything has to happen mid first before they then move out to these side lanes. And uh, given that Han Summer has just reset, I'd be surprised if they continue to push that much harder. Um, yeah, okay, he has just picked up the Runans as well. I want to have a quick look at how much ward... Oh yeah, okay, so they're fully stocked on Vision. They have the control wards available to them. Everything that they need is in their inventory, so now they can start setting up for this Baron. 
Rogue, uh, even last year, were pretty good at setting up, you know, the triangles of vision that we talk about, the deep control wards that we talk about. Schalke are trying to find a pick. This is what we tend to see teams do when they're falling behind. You look for one catch. You just try and get one kill at a time, one bit of gold at a time. But Rogue and Larson very safe. He's always been a very safe oh. mid laner as the engage comes in. Lorwax perhaps overextended. Vander's gonna gobble him up there, so he's inspired. He's overextended. The Ignite is ticking away. Enix going in. The sleep's landed on Hans Summer. And perhaps Rogue have gone rogue here. They put the blinkers on. They went into the enemy jungle and Schalke just gobbled up all of those kills. It's two to them already and Schalke gonna turn on towards the Baron. Now the jungle is dead and Schalke have a Baron in their eyes. Can Larson save Rogue like he often has done in the past? Finn level 16 for Hell. I've seen Finn on Aatrox in this position before, Vedius. I've seen him 1v3. We'll see if he can do it again. Larson's here as well. Finn with the world end of Dream's trying to jump in, but Finn is in the back line. Inax almost down. That's one, that's two. Larson and Finn, it's just the rogue show here in the river. Finn gets another connection onto Lorwax. Can't quite find the third, but he flashes forward. It's a double. It's Finn. He's 20 years old, Vedius. Look at him just shredding through Schalke. Larson jumping in. He just can't do it against Finn. Oh, no, one chased off with the explosive shot. Oh, no, he's going to have to flash. The Sleep lands on Finn, but he's gobbled up once again. And now they're going to turn it back onto the Zoe. And Summer teleports in. Abadage has nowhere to go. And Rogue just take all the kills in the river. <laughs> well, we did get to see an example of Rogue going Rogue. Uh, but fortunately, Larson and Finn were able to save the day. And let's have a look back at exactly what happens here. They're trying to push into enemy vision without actually having the Tristana there to properly support them. Finn doesn't immediately teleport and Inspired just gets caught out. Rogue were not expecting five people of Schalke to just be in this brush and getting collapsed upon. And at this point, you're thinking, okay, Schalke, this is your avenue back into the game. But then we see Finn. Look at his target prioritization in this fight. He wants to just shut down one of the main damage dealers in Inax. So that's the target that he goes for. Straight onto the back line. Larson is dealing with the front line. Abadage is trying to go for the one-on-one, -on -one, but Larson's just disengaging, and no one is dealing with Finn. Lorox has to deal with the Baron, and there's no one left to keep Inax alive, which means that Finn can just find kill after kill after kill. And that world ender just extending with every kill that he gets. At the end, Odo Amne is chased off with the explosive shot. Abadage does manage to pick up a kill. Yeah, it's, a the TP. it's a little unfortunate that Larson doesn't get that final bomb proc off, because then he would have had the reset to be able to jump out and probably survive. Um, but that meant that Abadage was able to at least get one kill onto Larson. I'm curious now as to how many actually got the Baron. I think it was four. Uh, yeah, the only person that didn't get it was Larson in the top lane, uh, but that's okay. Rogue now with the Baron buff can look to try and break into the base of Schalke. 27 minutes in and Rogue have truly cracked Schalke. 8,000 gold ahead. Schalke, they saw that brief moment of opportunity, that glimpse of their first win of the split, and then it just collapsed in front of their eyes. You can see Finn now down towards the bottom lane, pushing in on that Aatrox. Four members mid for Rogue. Larson pushing in top where he can. But he's willing just to step back whenever Shao could get near him. I mean, Finn is really strong. Yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> uh, uh, level 17 now. The levels alone make him extremely difficult to deal with, let alone the fact that he's got three completed items. Uh, he's having a great game so far. Uh, we can see it once again. Rogue looking to play through all three lanes. The Dristana without the Baron buff, not as threatening. But of course, Trist, Siege, still very potent. Um, Rogue going to take their time. Only a minute left. I think they should commit a few more resources towards the bot side of the map. They're, they're a lot stronger than I think they think they are, which means that they could just go for a fight and win. Yeah. But they're playing much more of the conservative style of let's just slowly break into the base through multiple um, areas of the map and, you know, kind of chip away at Schalke rather than just win a fight and end the game. I mean, this is safe League of Legends, right? You, sure. You don't have to take a 70-30 play, which is it's, probably what it would be. I mean, I'd call it like 90-10, like there's sure. a three-item Tristana. They did lose a, a fight when there were 5,000 gold behind a yeah, little while but ago, I think that it's one of the things so. where I think, I think they just group, you know, yeah. just group and fight. Um, like, they could just force that uh, bot inhibitor right now. Um, and I like the fact that they're playing through two lanes now rather than three, because I think they split their resources a little too thin. Um, that wasn't a pun. <laughs> Let's see. Larson and Rogue are right, sitting in the bot ring right now. Again, like part of the problem for Rogue is they kind of have to rely on Inspire to be the engage. He's, of course, very squishy, unless they want to try and find a flank with Vanda. So I guess that's probably another reason why they're taking the slow and steady approach. Easy enough to do. Larson and Finn with a two-level advantage over Abadage, one over Odo Amne. And now that mid lane inhibitor tower down to about a third of its HP. Here comes a bit of an engage from Finn. Knock back, Buster shot, Larson disengages. No RKOs coming in here. Larson used the cleanse as well, but the mid lane in hip tower will fall. 
And Merc's like, okay, that's enough, enough, uh, enough for us for now. There's a Cloud Drake that we can go and secure. You, you, you just want to keep that clock ticking over. Yes, Rogue perhaps could have won it. If they'd hard engaged, perhaps they could have done it. But here, this is safer. Wait five minutes, get yourself Cloud Soul. Sure. Uh, the the other thing you have to remember is that you see it in solo queue all the time. When people know they have a gold lead, they just keep sieging. Being aware of when you can reset, um, you get chipped away at when you're making these sieges, right? It's like a normal battle. You know, if you're trying to break down the gates, you're slowly going to lose men as they're dealing with the archers and the pots of hot oil that's being dropped on top of you, right? Yeah. Um, and you've got to pick the right time to be able to disengage, recognize, okay, we've done enough damage. We've got to restock, resupply, and then we go and set up the siege once again. Because if you overstay, you're going to realize that you're just kind of left by yourself only with a single man and a shield. And uh, that's not going to be enough to be able to break the, the gates of the castle. So I like the respect being shown by Rogue and... Uh, they're just going to spend their gold now look to do the same play again. Have you ever heard of Defender's Advantage, Vedius? Defender's Advantage? Defender's, so it's a battle term. If you are sitting in, say you're in Helm's Deep, yeah. and your medics are right near you, and your food supplies are right near you, it's a lot easier to defend. Yes, exactly. You can get resupply. It's exactly what you're explaining. But I wanted to give you the terminology. No, 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 yeah. It, and it's get a good Lord one. of the Rings in there, because that's always <laughs> important to me. But no, you're right. It's, the, it's that idea of how quickly can you resupply. And of course, Shalka can resupply much faster than that. Fountain's me. there for them. Ready but and waiting. In any case, the Baron spawns around a minute and a half. That's likely the objective that Rogue will want to fight for. And out in the open plain, uh, the. Pelennor Fields, they were called. The, the, uh, the, army, Tirith, technically, the army with greater numbers is the team uh, or the army that's likely to win. And uh, you can equate numbers of an army to gold being spent in okay. uh, League. And I think that given that Rogue have a 10k gold advantage, they have the equivalent of 10 extra, 10k extra men so in their army. So Rogue are the Lannisters and Shalko are the Starks. Is that what you're telling me? I mean, yes. Okay. Yes, I would say that. Um, we'll see if the Starks can hold out in this one. I'm really worried about, I don't know, never mind. Forget spoilers. We're going to ditch this now. No, we, yeah, we've <laughs> that. we didn't spoil anything. Those are just two names of the houses. In excellent, Game of excellent, excellent. Okay, so Baron... Finn has TP. Uh, there's... Yes. Uh, this is what I want to highlight. The um, you can do it, mate. This ward. That's the ward I want you to pay attention to because if uh, Finn is going to flank, that's the ward that he's going to try and take advantage of okay. to come in from behind. Uh, while Rogue likely look to push in through mid and then move upwards. Uh, oh, I'm. Thank you, Observers, for highlighting that that's not a teleportable ward. That's actually really well highlighted. Yes, thank you very that. much, Observers, because that is a... Uh, that's the blue trinket Far ward. Alteration. Yeah, yeah, you can't TP to that one. So um, they're not going to use that to TP, in fact. No. Do you want to highlight any other wards? No, because they, they don't have any other flanking wards. That's they, one down <laughs> here by Razor Beaks. <laughs> I don't think they'll TP to that one, though. <laughs> okay, so... We'll see if Finn just goes for the win, if the fight begins as Lorox... Whoa, that's a long buster shot. That's the TP. Didn't use a ward, used a minion. I'm not even sure if he needed it to do it. And that's going to pop the ultimate, but already they've lost dreams. And uh, at the moment, it's only Ooh. nightmares here for Shalka, inspired with a beautiful engage. The follow-up coming out from Rogue, and Shalka are running for the hills. Helm's Deep was not enough to hold them as they lose another. Lorox falls. Abadage chased off towards the top side. Odo Omne, the next target, alongside that inhibitor. Rogue might not even need the Baron. They don't even need the help of the big purple worm. They're pushing in for the win. Abadage is TPing back to base, but he's not going to be there in time to save it. Rogue take the Nexus Towers. Rogue take the game. They go four and three in the LEC. Solid game overall from Rogue. Huge props to the bot lane as well, winning a matchup and punishing the small mistakes that NX and Dreams did make in order to come out on top. And then they turned what should have been uh, two losing lanes uh, in the top and bot into actually a winning advantage in bot and pressure in the mid lane, which Inspired was very quick to take advantage of. Early Drakes in their favor, they were able to set up a lot of invades on the bot side. And I think overall, Rogue played a very clean and solid game. We did get to see them go Rogue a we bit. Did. Uh, it was a little bit earlier than I expected, the 24, 24 and a half. And a half. I'll, I'll give you uh, that, 30 uh, seconds uh, leeway, values. Um, but yeah, this is a trend that we do see from Rogue, where they make that one slip up. Sometimes it's they try to force a fight too hard. Sometimes it's because they're slightly out of position. Sometimes they mess up in some of their setup. But you can see how often they're able to very quickly correct and then come back in control. But it's usually players like Larson, like Finn, that end up compensating for those small mistakes. And uh, we saw it a lot in week one. Uh, we saw it a bit in week two, but then they struggled in week three, especially against the Soraka that we highlighted. So uh, overall, very solid game from Rogue. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you want to say who you thought was the most solid or the best on Rogue, you can vote Kia Player of the Game at LEC on Twitter. It's Finn, Inspired, and Larson. So it's like Aragorn, 
Legolas. Yeah, okay, you need to Gimli? stop. You need to stop. <laughs> Which one's Gimli? That's the question you're asking. <laughs> um, yeah, you can vote. I think they all actually had uh, had pretty good games overall. I think I would probably give it to Finn. I yeah. think. I think that he was the. Uh, I think that he was probably the best performing player of this game. Here's the thing, was it Finn or was it uh, Inspire being in the right place to help Finn? I'm gonna leave you with that in your head. You cook that up, you think about that, Vettius, because Misfits Gaming have pulled off a massive comeback, but their win streak might end tonight against the undefeated G2 Esports. We're gonna, uh, we're also gonna ask Larson if he is in fact better than Bjergsen, <laughs> so don't go anywhere. The Misfits' actual goal this year is to just grow their players. The positive side is that there's no pressure on us. I think people are going to be quite surprised with uh, what we can bring to the table. I personally have plans on winning this year, so I just want to win LEC, I want to win MSI, I want to win everything. I'm sure we will be the strongest of that.